Welcome back to The Watch. Okay, House of Dragon Episode 3. Uh, guys, I think this is the best episode so far. Now, I do understand we're going into this cautiously. We've been burnt before with, uh, we, sorry, I was going to say real time, with Game of Thrones, all right? But if it really looks like there are some competent people working on the writing, dialogue, execution, and so far, it seems to be consistent, dare I say, even getting a little better. Now, when I say this episode might be one of the best, there's, there's actually some elements in which I could criticize more so than other uh, episodes. They're minor points, granted, but the thing that I think really lifts this episode is that we get some great action, and on top of that, there are some really awesome character moments that lift the episode. There are some standout moments from Viserys, the king, for Damon in this episode. Uh, they, they, the, those two particularly shine, but Otto is just as conniving as ever. Uh, there's some really interesting things that we get to see from the queen. A princess. She comes off a little bit more unlikable in this, but it's justified in terms of what she's going through, and they give it a good kind of way to round it off. But seriously, the, the standout character for me was actually the king, Viserys. He's growing on me more and more. I really like this character. I like what they're doing with him in terms of, he, like, he, he's not a fool, yet he's struggling with these decisions. He's trying, and he's a good man. He's, well, he's a good father. That really comes through in this episode. Uh, there are some really subtle, you know, um, elements in terms of the, the writing that have really good subtext that you can end up just having a chat about in terms of what do you think is the true meaning of what they're saying here and there are even sometimes multiple valid interpretations you can take that is all very in line with the character. I've had fun chatting with Gary from Nerdrotic and Mauler, uh, and this is over on the Nerdrotic channel, as just a kind of a roundup discussion after each episode. So do go check out those uh, live streams if you want to see what the discussion is. And of course, this is my dedicated review. Overall, I'd give this episode almost a 7.5, nearly 8 out of 10. There, like I said, there are some things that I can criticize from just like you know, I a more, a more objective standpoint that it doesn't really make sense, but they are very minor. And this, if this is the biggest criticisms I can make out of this episode, House of Dragons, guys, is uh, probably the best piece of media out at the moment. The cut out of current, it's not the best in the world, and I wouldn't even say it's better than Game of Thrones episode, oh, sorry, season one. But the writing is competent. The, the, the characters are interesting, engaging. Some people might think that the uh, first part of this episode is a bit slow, but nothing that is presented on screen is going to waste. Every single scene is doing sometimes multiple things to push forward plot, establish certain arcs, or, uh, you know, establish, round out, give us more information about the character development. It's all very important stuff, which makes it very engaging. I enjoyed even the slower part, but this episode ends with a bang, like a, a big, like engaging exciting battle sequence it's not without flaws i have some criticism one big one i, I would even say but overall it's very enjoyable especially what it's saying about the character this is what makes fight scenes battles good when they're informed by something that's important to the plot I mean, I, I've got to give a contrast to this with uh, Rings of Power. Uh, we've did a live stream review on Rings of Power where there are elements in Rings of Power that you could cut entirely and it wouldn't affect the plot or story characters at all, both in episode one and episode two. Shockingly so. There's one thing involving climbing a mountain. You could cut that wouldn't change the plot or story, uh, and there's another element that involves uh, something in the sea, a monster in the sea. I'll just say, you could cut that entire thing like uh, specific, because like, I'm not saying cut the entire part on the sea, but that part especially. So contrast this with the battle scene. Avoiding spoilers, you can't cut this. And also, it's so important with establishing what a character is capable of, where he'll get pushed to, uh, and it's and as a result, you're invested so much more, like tremendously so, and becomes far more enjoyable as a result. I thought this episode was a blast. And if, if, if House of the Dragon can just get better and better with each episode, that's what it's done so far for me. I'm on board. Bring it on. Uh, I want good media, and it's a, it's a great refreshing thing to get something this competent with so many other works of media that are just so poorly done. So, that is my non-spoiler portion of this uh, episode. Like, two thumbs up. It's, it's not only good, it's ebbing to really good. Not phenomenal, not the best in the world, 
but very enjoyable. And so now we're getting into spoilers and we'll go chronologically. I'll bring up, you know, uh, House of the Dragon right here. And so one of the areas in which I could have most the most criticisms for this episode is actually this opening sequence here, because there's a couple of little, like, things that, you know, that, that, look, they are small, but they very well can be criticised. So this guy is, uh, is getting nailed to a post to be fed to the crabs, and uh, his dialogue is a little inconsistent, where at first is like, ah, oh, you suck, you'll never do this, uh, and then he's like, ah, oh, no, stop, it has, it has, ah, oh, you suck, you suck, ah, oh, no, and so, a bit of inconsistent characterization there. In terms of getting nailed to the board, we actually see close up the nailing, and if you really want it, you could just pull his hand off the nail, so they, like, Yes, I think in other scenes they, they're shown being tied to the boards. This one, it just looks like he's being nailed there. So I could just pull it off and, and, and leave. Uh, then uh, the dragon arrives, and it starts off, well, yeah, frying everyone. Then the dragon lands and starts to try and fry people on the ground. And to me, this is like a very poor tactical decision. And it plays out that way because he's now far more vulnerable to arrow fire. And Damon actually gets shot. Not a, you know, death wound. But they're trying to convey that this battle with the pirates is nowhere near a clean cut and easy as I have a dragon, I win. But the issue is they kind of make a very poor tactical choice to try and convey that by having the dragon land. If it, uh, no, that makes it more vulnerable. Keep it in the sky. And so I would criticise that. I know what they're trying to do narratively with this, though. I, I, they could have done it without making a poor, such a poor choice in that regard. And then, of course, we see this uh, crab eater fellow, you know, the leader of the, uh, the pirates and stuff. Uh, so one of the interesting moments, like, so the guy that was getting nailed, he's like, ah, oh, yes, my prince has come to save me, and then he just gets crushed by the dragon, friendly fire. It, it conveys a couple of things that, um, one, maybe the prince was careless, uh, or he just doesn't care, or he wasn't paying attention, and it wasn't his fault, you could say, but you could say that he just didn't give us stuff, he's focusing on other things. It, 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 this is one of those interesting things where it raises some uh, discussion you could have about what Damon was doing in regards to allowing that to happen, even if he was aware of it. Thing is, though, with all these different interpretations, each one is actually quite valid and perfectly in line and doesn't undermine his character. And if, he, if it was on purpose, it shows a ruthlessness that is very much consistent with what we see at the end of this episode. And so it very well could be intentional. All right, so after that scene, we see the king doting over his new son and we get context as to how much time has passed. Three years since the last episode. And you've got to give this show props. They are doing these time jumps between episodes very effectively. They, they, they establish what, what the kind of the status quo is, has been through that time period pretty quickly, quite efficiently, through context, and it works very well. They don't need someone to just sit down and spell it all out that the king is still having trouble with his daughter because the daughter is feeling a bit spurned or worried that, you know, now he has a son. Will this no one needs to say that. It's, it's shown through the context and what happens really well. Same with the relationship between the king and his wife now, where last episode ended with him declaring he's going to marry Ellicent. And uh, was she a bit uncomfortable with it? But now we see the evolution by their relationship. And one of the things I love here, I personally love how much the king, it's so clear how much the king loves his son. I think this is just a wonderful element to show like genuine wholesome fatherhood because I, I love my children as equally as much as you can see the king doting on his new, newly born son. And he really cares about his daughter still. This episode really shows that he, he does not want to supplant his daughter, undermine his daughter because he has this new son. He still loves her and wants her to be happy. He says it as a great line. Here it is. It is not my wish to command her. I wish her to be happy. Like, he is a good father. He's trying his best. And, man, I, every episode makes me like the king even more. And even small things like this. Uh, uh, this is one of those things where if this show was intent on uh, portraying a negative uh, um, uh, you know, uh, commentary on masculinity and men and everything, they are not doing that with the king. This is subverted because they're showing the king. Sh this is wholesome fatherhood. Good, like, great, you know, wholesome masculinity. It's brilliant. Uh, and it just makes me... Uh, like love the show even more, and I gotta say I do not see a woke agenda at all. Like we, uh, and what's interesting, another thing, that one of the showrunners that were politicized, trying to politicize this show by saying it's pushing a message about toxic masculinity and all that stuff, has actually uh, left the production. That's e that's an even more positive sign that this is not going to be 
subverted and uh, reappropriated to push someone's political agenda. I hope they just want what they're doing now. Ma give us a really interesting good show. Look at this shot. Look how happy uh, Viserys is there with his son. I love it. There's important build-up in this scene that's introduced right away, and it's the context that th the people who are fighting the uh, the pirates in the other end of the kingdom are asking for aid, they're struggling, and the king is just like, I just want a day without politics to celebrate my son's name day, his second birthday. And uh, you can see where the king is at, and he's a, he's a loving father, and he's uh, like, but it's also important that he addresses this issue, it's urgent, and you can see where he's like or the position that is coming from. So it builds his character, yet it establishes something really important as to the what's going to happen towards the end of the episode. That the pirates are an issue. The king needs to address it, and it's done naturally. It does multiple things. This show so far is very well made. I'm going to be singing a decent amount of its praises through this review, even with some of the criticisms I have. Like I already mentioned, some they don't undermine the good of this show and how enjoyable and well done this episode is. This scene really effectively establishes the relationship, the new dynamic between the princess and now, you know, the queen who was once her very close friend and handmaid. Specifically, what this is, does really effectively is the new power dynamic. Before, um, uh, Alicent was the handmaid to her, she had to obey, but now she's the queen and she wants the, the minstrel to leave, princess wants him to stay, princess orders him to stay and then the queen says, I order you to leave as the queen and the minstrel obeys her because she has the high authority. Completely new dynamic. Okay, and, and it also establishes character because we can see that the princess is not comfortable with it and uh, she, uh, you could see the conflict because is she, she, she perhaps wants to be Alicent's friend still, yet Alicent is the very, uh, you know, reason why her position as the heir might be getting undermined. Good conflict. I also love this scene. They're all in the carriage together and the king just, he says, can't we all just have a, a nice time together as a family? It's like, this is a good father, trying to be a good father, yet there's all these political issues where his daughter is, uh, you know, uh, she, she's in a bad mood, she thinks she's being supplanted and he's just trying his best. A lot of small things I really appreciate. This is a, a great shot, like set up scene for, uh, you know, a medieval camp. Like, like uh, they set up an encampment for a hunt, a grand hunt to celebrate. Like, hunts were a grand thing, depending on who was holding them in the medieval times. It's an accurate element and it's depicted authentically. It looks brilliant. And a couple of small things. I loved how they show a variety of noblemen. They're not all just cookie cutter the same. They, they all have their different, you know, um, uh, clothing at times. Uh, you also see some different food on display. There's like, um, animal, like animals or food being on a spit being cooked. It just looked authentic. It looked good. And then we have a scene where everything in this show so far is every scene it's doing something important this scene once again establishes some of the conflict with the pirates but also introduces an important character he's uh, he's got like a uh, a gimpy foot like an injury like he has he has a like a, a, a big limp as a result and he subtly kind of just asks to join the ladies but that allows allows him to listen in on what's going on and uh, there's a bit of a disagreement between the princess and uh, an a more elderly lady and uh, it shows the princess's attitude because she basically says what do you you don't know what you're talking about you just like eating cake essentially i kind of thought that this was a bit of a setup to uh, show that she is not good at uh at diplomacy she's slighting other noble houses which would cause more division in the realm and that as a result she might be you know being denied heir to the throne if this is her talent at it and it wouldn't be an unjustified position. And this is not, this wouldn't be denying her the throne because she's a woman, It'd be denying her the throne because she's just not good at it clearly by her interactions and attitude. But they, like, but Viserys, the king, he doesn't even do that. He even reaffirms that she will be the heir, and look, that might be subverted in the future, to show the conflict in the king, where is that? Especially if she continues showing herself as a, a poor diplomat, poor leader, to, making division in the king and stuff like that. Yeah, she wouldn't be the best, you know, heir to the throne. And look at this guy, he's listening in on the whole conversation. Like, he's not there by accident. The show is setting up important characters and character arcs. 
there's the animals getting roasted. It's just like small details like that that uh, adds a, an authentic feeling to this. She gets approached by a Lannister. Different type of Lannister than we saw before. Again, it's just an example of every scene doing something. There's a great exchange between uh, the princess and her father here, and in actual fact they have a fight where they end up raising their voices in front of everyone. And, uh, you know, she comes to him trying to say that she is not some prize to be profited or, uh, you know, sold off to other people. But Viserys is looking at this that you need to get married, you're of age now, if you're going to be an heir, I, this is an important thing to do. He calls the Lannister man, who is basically uh, almost suggesting uh, a uh, marriage to her, that his and that is arrogant and self-righteous, but I love that in Viserys, he comes right back at her, you have that in common, <laughs> and things. Then he says, even I do not exist above tradition and duty, and it builds the conflicts, the character, perspectives, a very effective scene. Of course, the princess, she storms off unimpressed, and she rides off, one of the Kingsguard follow her, sets up an int interesting conversation where she starts complaining, and I like that the show doesn't let her get away with it, because her guard, the king's guard here, his reply is brilliant. He says, many in the realm would trade places with you, princess. It's like, boom, yes. <laughs> and so even this guy, he, gets, he puts her in a place because she's being petulant, right? But then she says, I, I, everything I do has no importance or significance. And then he gets to correct her again. He's like, well, really, you, I mean, you know, you chose me to be a king's guard. I never would have had this position. I was a low born and all that stuff. And he changed my life for the better. It builds their relationship, but it also contextualizes that she's not completely with out, you know, uh, like influence in her position. So at first I was worried they weren't going to follow up on the fact that the king has certain parts of his body rotting, all right, and it looks like it's being poisoned. And yet, no, they're, they're on top of it. They show the king is tired, uh, and, it, and it seems like an unnatural tiredness. Is and to the point where at moments he legitimately looks like he's sick and is dealing with something that is affecting his health. And that's, I first noticed it here, and then it's consistent through the whole episode. So again, they're not forgetting getting about important plot points, they're being consistent all the way through. I like this scene as well, it builds the king's authority, it shows that look, he's in a bad mood, he's feeling sick and tired and he's getting a bit drunk and so he, he does, he's, he's not ready to entertain more politics, yeah and one of the, the Lannister guy, he comes to you know, talk about politics and the king's having none of it and he basically just uh, you know, uh, disingenuously interprets things to be possible offences because he, he is, is full of it. He's, he is annoyed and uh, it's in line with how he's feeling at the moment. But I also kind of like that it showed that the king can really stick it to some nobles. He has authority, he has strength and people, he's not a pushover, right? He's actually a very complex, nuanced character where you can see why people might perceive him as weak, yet he's not completely weak, but he's also a really strong, good man trying to do the right thing and has trouble making the right decisions when no matter what he does, he's gonna be offending or upsetting someone, which is a big issue as a king because that could cause instability in the kingdom. See, look at him, he's like, he's not having a bar of it. And so the Lannister guy, he, he withdraws knowing that like, you know, he, he digs a bit of his own grave here. Otto comes down and uh, Mauler pointed this out in our discussion. I think this is a good point where Otto basically wants to cede an idea to the king politics and he the king doesn't respond very uh, I guess uh, positively and Otto takes the <laughs> the sign right away and is like all right yeah it's not the right time to push it his suggestion is that um, his newly born son marries his daughter the current heir to the throne you can see why Otto would be suggesting this because this new son is also Otto's grandson he wants his own family on the throne and he thinks that this would serve both you know, interest in terms of it wouldn't deny uh, the princess her, her uh, right as heir, but it would also give the son. And so it, politically, you can see how it lines up and it serves Otto's interests as well. And the Targaryens have never been shy about marrying siblings or anything. It would be in line with, the, with their tradition, but the king's not in the mood, so he doesn't push it. Uh, then another councilman comes forward and suggests probably an even better political match for the princess, and it's that she marry. Um, so remember the king, who he, like, he, he was thinking about marrying that really young daughter in the, in the previous episode to that prominent wealthy family? This guy says, why doesn't the princess marry that little girl's brother? It would be uh, a great thing to build alliance. That, that family who was spurned kind of gets what they wanted, their own child, because if, if the princess remains to be heir to the throne. 
they would then sit on the throne as well. It's a, what I like, the politics are valid. They're logical in this show. This isn't just people pulling out random comments out of their rear end and then presenting it in such a way that the characters think they're saying something intelligent when what they're really saying is nonsense. I gotta reference uh, Rings of Power because they do that a lot in that show where the characters are presented as saying something intelligent or wise, but if you actually listen to the words, it's nonsense. Contrast with this, what they're saying makes sense. Makes sense completely with the, 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 the previous episodes, what has been established in the characters, what's been established with the dynamics. It makes sense. We cut to the princess and uh, the Kingsguard here. This is another just really well executed little scene. Uh, they're talking over briefly, they hear a noise, and uh, the Kingsguard gets up and is looking around, and uh, you know something is gonna happen, but you don't exactly know what. Could it be bandits? Could it be a rabbit or nothing? Could it be... Uh, well, what we did see, a boar that um, that uh, charged them. So the suspense was very well built up. Uh, it was paced well, and the reveal, you know, was dynamic. Of course, the boar goes on and basically knocks him off his feet. So the boar comes out. This part, I, all right, the guy's legs should basically be broken at this point. Um, but anyway, he survives it pretty easily. And there's another part where, you know, I think I need to criticize because the boar now charges the princess. And as the boar arrives, it is basically, the boar is on top of her and she should be getting gored, essentially dead. But there's a good while the boar is, and then we see that she was holding the boar off. Maybe, may, maybe I could give it to you. No, I don't know. That's a while that the boar is heavy, strong. She's, you know, a, a, a slight young lady. Not sure she could do that, but the king's man he comes in. Oh, sorry, king's guy he comes in, slays the boar, and then she gets a knife and just starts going ballistic, stabbing it and killing it. Interesting kind of moment for her. It shows that I guess in a moment of uh, is it desperation, she will lash out violently. She 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 has that in her. Sets up something interesting about her character. So even though there were elements to criticize, I did like the reveal. I like that, you know, they're showing boars can be really dangerous and people did hunt boars in medieval times and all that stuff. So it kind of balance comes out even at the end, even my criticisms. This scene here, one of the best in the episode for me, like Viserys, the, the, sorry, the delivery, the actor here, just absolutely like nails it. And it reveals the conflict that he, that he has here about um, his son, the heir, and uh, he, he talks about the Targaryens, that some were born as dreamers, and that he had a vision or a dream that saw his son on the throne and is really conflicted. And the delivery is just brilliant. Like, there's a moment where he gets really emotional. Like, top tier acting. Like, yes, this, this scene and the big battle at the end, this really lifts the episode for me. What a brilliant character, and I gotta give massive props to the delivery, the actor. This also contextualizes some of the relationship between uh, Alicent and the king. Uh, there does seem to be some genuine affection grown in her towards the king, her husband now, though we do see her, she is still very much influenced, some could even say controlled, by o Otto. Maybe not though. I'll get to it when we come to the scene. So they catch a stag and there was this interesting kind of s plot element where they thought it was going to be a white stag, which was a symbol symbolic of royalty. And if he could uh, capture a white stag here, this would be a, a great kind of omen, portent thing indicating the, the future of his son because they were on the hunt in celebration for his son. Uh, but still, it's, it's a big stag anyway. And uh, this really shows that the king is still suffering and sick where he, he, he he's struggling to, to kill this stag they need to hold it for him and he misses the first one and then he has to hit it again and everyone kind of it's an awkward clap this establishing his sick i do hate the spear he's using i think it's a bit of a horrible design the actual blade spear portion isn't long enough uh, and especially if you're if you think you should be using a boar spear this isn't a good boar spear it's almost like a partisan in the way that it's designed just really short not the best thing to try and take out a, a deer with and yeah look, look at this shot very much showing the king is struggling. So we see the princess and she's got blood in her, sh her hair from the boar and uh, she sees the white stag and is this interpreting that she is the true heir uh, because uh, the white stag seems to have been, I don't know, blessing her or appearing to her. Uh, 
And then she comes back into the camp and everyone takes notice because she's walking back into the camp with a boar. Like, that's a big thing. If she just, it looks like she went out her own with, with just a, you know, a king's guard um, on, the, on the two of them. And they come back with a very dangerous boar dead that she, it's almost like she bagged it. Just the two of them, which is true. They did kill it together. And this could be interpreted as a pretty like building moment for her. Because if it, many in the, you know, um, uh, kingdom, the nobility around were questioning her metal, well, she comes ba back basically strutting, yeah, I just took out a wild boar with only two people. This would be contextualized because a lot of the hunts that go after wild boars would be a group of people and they'd be cautious and make sure no one gets injured and stiff. And remember, in Game of Thrones, um, is it Robert Baratheon, the king? He gets killed by a boar in that, uh, even though that's in the future. But still, boars can be very dangerous. And it says something that she comes back in the camp with one. So the hunt is over, they're back at the castle, and uh, Otto is talking with his daughter, the queen now, saying that, uh, don't you want the best for your child, for him to be named as heir? And she says, I want the best for my child. And it's interesting, this is about as blunt as Otto will ever be with anyone, it seems like, because he's very clever at speaking with double meaning to serve his own interests, um, uh, but not reveal those in the counsel that he gives. Here, he just flat out comes out and says that he wants his grandchild on the throne as heir, supplanting the princess, and he basically says the only one that's going to convince him is you. Why don't you go talk with the king? So Otto says to Alicent, you must guide the king towards reason. He'll never do it on his own. And it seems like the setup is that she's going to go and just obey her father. Yet this scene, interestingly, she doesn't even talk about that. She's more concerned about what is troubling her husband. And he explains that, you know, it's this issue with, uh, um, you know, Damon and the battle that's going on. And oh, there's one of my favorite lines in this where she asks him what's bothering him. He says that I am forever doomed to anger one person for the pleasing of another. What a great line. First, very well constructed in terms of just the flow of the language. I am forever doomed to anger one person for the pleasing of another. Because uh, there are awkward ways that sentence could be constructed. And so to make it flow so naturally almost uh, in, in the kind of like the language of this world, uh, that takes some thought consideration. And then it conveys character and that what he's struggling with. I love it brilliant line and then she actually wants to try and help him resolve or uh, make a decision and the issue is he is afraid that if he goes to help Damon that that seems to be uh, like letting Damon win. Damon basically is going off fighting this war he didn't approve and it's like he's acknowledging it and, and ratifying that war by going to help them and then the princess sorry the queen she just says something pretty honest is like okay what is best for the realm though? If these pirates run free, clearly that convinces him because in the very next scene, he makes his decision and he is giving the order to go help Damon and quell the threat. Shows the influence of the queen. And like I mentioned, the queen it wasn't talking to him to push her own son. Maybe she will, but it's interesting because it raises a question as to how manipulatable she is by Otto at this point. Because now she is the queen, she has more authority than him in some, in a lot of ways even interesting stuff and I love that you can think about and consider those things this is good construction good story and all these things I'm considering either like many of the possible conclusions that I'm ascribing to it is still in line with what's going on this is what makes a show interesting when you can just start talking about what might happen what is the possible interpretation of a given scene it's brilliant really good scene between the king and the princess now where a lot of the air gets cleared the king basically pledges to her that he will never replace her as the throne but it also shows that one he cares for he says that, again he reiterates how much he loved her mother she made a man out of me i actually think that line is fine i think um marriage is actually a really important wonderful thing that uh help men become better this has that in there. I think it's brilliant. I love that the king will acknowledge that because a loving husband, you, they usually do. And I'll say it too. My wife has made me a better man. Okay. This is one of the great benefits of marriage. And I think my wife would also say that I've helped her become a better woman. We want to improve each other. And look, so I think that line is actually really nice. There's a discussion about marrying for advantage. And, uh, he actually says that, you know, I married for revenge, but I still love your mother, so you need to marry for revenge. She says, but you didn't really do it the second time round. And he says, that is true enough. 
I basically submitting to that where I think he, the king still had a defense saying, yeah, but I married for, you know, important political reasons first. I at least did it once. You should at least do it once too, perhaps. But then he does do something that honestly, I think is a great gesture of, I, I guess, diplomacy to reach out to his daughter to still maintain the relationship. And he basically says, find one that pleases you as I did. Uh, like, so she gets to pick who she will marry, still, and he's, he's encouraging her, pick someone who will be a good political marriage, but you pick. Pick one that pleases you. And so he's a great guy, he's a loving father. And then he swears to her on, on her mother's memory that she will not be supplanted. My own prediction is that there is going to be a supplanting, and uh, if the writers maintain their... Uh, talent, right? Their, their competence. They're going to uh, justify, if this happens, they will justify and give the king good reason for him to believe that, you know, she, uh, need, someone else, you know, his son needs to be the heir. And of course that will cause even a greater divide because of this, you know, kind of vow he makes in this moment. I think it's a, they're not doing this by accident, they're setting up something intentionally. So now we see the kind of battle that's waging with these uh, crab feeder, you know, pirates. And we see that they're, you know, like, they're bunkered up in these caves that are protecting him from the dragon fire. Kind of makes a bit of sense. I did have a question mark about resources, like, uh, you know, uh, they're saying that um, the the attacking force, which is, you know, Damon and um, the this Valerian house, I believe their names are, uh, they're running out of resources. And I was like, well, where are the crab feeders getting theirs? Unless they're being supported by the free cities or somewhere. That isn't said in the show. That's me kind of explaining a potential plot hole with my own head cannon. It's a small thing. But they set up the current tactical position that if they send in their own men into these caves in which they don't have any reconnaissance on, that it would be a maze, it would be a slaughter. And so it's a bit of a standoff at the moment and they feel they're running out of resources and can't maintain this kind of siege for very long. We saw some ships trying to assail that beach and they're just getting destroyed or quite, one does it get destroyed from, is it trebuchets or something, shooting back at them. So that's the pol that, that's the tactics of the given situation, and they feel they need bait to draw someone out, but that that would be suicide, who would be willing to do it? Someone says Damon, but it's like, are you crazy? Like, even Damon wouldn't do that. That's the setup. This is really important setup, because Damon arrives, he lands, you know, gets there, and uh, then the, uh, the messengers from the king they arrive as well, they give Damon a note, and uh, you get, uh, I think, uh, you know, the, there's a narration from the king saying it. This is what I love, this is one of, also one of my favourite moments in this episode, because day, like, um, you, you don't really get to hear what the letter says, but Damon's reaction is to almost, he thinks about it, and then he starts to basically kill the messenger, starts to bash him to death, and you're like, what the heck? Is this an overreaction? But then you get to find out exactly why, and it's so in line with his character that it reveals more about his character. It basically reveals, uh, it, and you already know that the king is offering to help, but it's almost the way that it's offered to help. Though time and circumstance have seen us estranged, know that it is not my desire to see you fail in your course. Know that it is not my desire to see you fail in course. This is the king naturally trying to be thoughtful, saying we've been estranged, but I don't want to see you fail. But Damon would naturally receive that as a taunt, because remember, he thinks his brother is weak, even though he loves his brother. His brother is weak, he is strong, and if his brother comes to help him win this battle, it would be a sign, he takes it, Damon takes it as a massive sign of failure. And he can't stand that. He thinks his brother is coming to rob the glory that he has been fighting for for nearly three years. And so he snaps, he bashes the messenger almost to death. People have to pull him off of, uh, from doing it. And then suddenly we see Damon rowing out on his own to the island with a flag of surrender. And we know what he's doing. He's, he's going out as bait. And usually the, the question would be, what would cause someone to be willing to do something so stupid, go out on their own, risk everything, potentially die on this vague chance that this 
tactic plan of being bait would work, but now we know exactly why, because of this setup, is there's a timer. Damon wants to win this battle now before his brother arrives with the fleet to steal his glory and make him out to look like a failure. And so he goes balls to the walls and puts himself out as bait. I love that setup, and it adds great context to such an engaging fight scene because I'm invested. This is what so many other shows, Rings of Power, has failed at, being properly invested in many other fight scenes and actions, and this, I'm engaged. I'm like, oh yeah, okay? What a brilliant setup, what brilliant character work, and you know what's phenomenal about all this? When Damon landed on his dragon, receives a note, walks out to the island, and even through the whole battle, and when he wins the battle, and he, I think he wins it in a pretty cool boss way, there is a, you know, one possible potential criticism that you think you could have been done a different way, but anyway, Throughout all of that, Damon, Matt Smith, doesn't say a single line. This is all characterization conveyed through acting, emoting. It, it's brilliant work. Matt Smith does it amazingly. But the writing it, it needs, I deserve such credit because so much characterization story plot happens without Damon saying a single word here. That is genuinely brilliant. Really, really good. The only criticism, there's a couple of small things and a, a big one, but because everything else and the setup and the investment is so good, it doesn't ruin it for me. And the issue I have here is the nature of the bait. So far, this is fine, what it's doing. People, the, the crab feeders, they're questioning, they're coming out slowly, cautiously. Is it a trap, is it not? What is he doing? It is surrendering, essentially. This is a Valerian steel sword he's presenting to them, which is worth a small fortune. And he is the king's brother. What a, like, prize to, ha to have captured, okay? So, oh, absolutely, this would pique their interest and draw out a couple, which happens, and is there, they come close, and then he, he just lashes out and starts taking them out. One of the things that I really liked about this action sequence uh, to begin with is that they're already spread apart and so that he's not surrounded and when he lashes out they all kind of have to just approach him from wherever they are which naturally would not make them group together and so he could try and take them on one at a time. He grabs his sword back, quickly slashes one down, takes out another I think some of the close cuts are, uh, they're not my favorite, okay? It would have been cool to see some great complex choreography to like take out one guy with a complex move and then take out another guy, especially if it was all one continuous cut. Would have, that would look brilliant. Still, this is a heck of a lot of fun. And it's such a powerful moment for Damon where he's just, he's cutting loose and he's taking out so many guys one at a time. Like, oh, he jumps, kicks a guy, rolls down, recovers. I love that. That was great. There were arrow. There were the archers on the side. I really got annoyed with the, the knock. I'm not annoyed at them saying knock. But then he says draw, and they draw, and they hold. You know those um, bows at full draw all the way until we see the arrows getting loosed. It's a like look. They did in the first Game of Thrones um, uh, where I don't know that girl holds. I forget her name. Holds the bow for ages. You grit or something, and. Uh, so anyway, pet peeve. Then I uh, granted it's a small nitpick, but it affects me more because I love medieval realism and medieval culture and all that stuff. Weapons and them being depicted, used accurately. This is one of those inaccurate elements. Now, in terms of like, is it pot armor? How much? So first he takes cover. That I really like. But then there are moments where Damon is running under direct arrow fire. And so he was still undercover, but now direct arrow fire. Is it plot armor that no, nothing is um, hitting him? I just noticed they're, they're shooting downwards, which means, like, I first thought that they were shooting in volleys, arcs to get the range, and aiming when you're shooting upwards like that is really difficult. I've tried it, okay? I'm an archer myself. I shoot medieval longbow and also medieval short recurve uh, at 100 and 110 pounds. I, I've done this myself. It's really hard to aim in, but. It's a much easier aim when you're shooting more directly. And okay, that makes me feel it's a bit more plot armor. It'd be more defensible if they were shooting in arcs, because that's hard, especially at distance. And you would do it if there's a large group of people that you're more guaranteed to at least hit someone. To, pin, to hit a single target that's moving, 
very difficult that way. It's more possible that it's still difficult. It's a moving target. So you maybe, you maybe could push that. It's a t difficult moving target. And that's why he's mostly not getting hit. He's still fighting people. I personally think they should have paced it so he's running to cover between volleys. He gets to cover between the first volley, sees him, as soon as the first one lands, he runs out, tries to take on, and then he maybe hear or see the arc, you know, of arrows coming in, he jumps to cover again. I think they could have done that, they didn't. Doesn't ruin the scene because it's still this brilliant badass moment for Damon. And also, because even though I'm saying there's a decent amount of plot armor here, he does eventually get hit, okay? Like, good camera work there as well. So, so this is a dynamic fight scene that also doesn't look cheap. They say loose, good on them. And so, should he have been hit there? Mm, you know, you know. So, this is perhaps what they're trying to show. The, the, um, the crab feeder guy, the, 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 the leader, he uh, wants Damon dead, and so he's sending out only a couple of men at a time, and here he sends out more. It's like, look, this sending out a couple didn't work, he took them out, let's send out more, higher chance of trying to defeat him. Damon, you know, just rushes them before they can group up on him. Takes out, a lot of this is, it's not like particularly complex choreography, but it's effective and it does the job. That guy was kind of just leaving himself open, it was a bit weak. The crab feeder guy, he, like the glass group just got killed, send out even more. Will it work? And so they're trying to say that the, the leader is seeing he needs to send out more men and more men to finally take this guy out proper. And this is where he gets shot. That's something I really like. Shows the armor doing something. He, two shots, seems like it only penetrated the armor a little bit. Definitely not enough to kill him. That is armor doing something. I actually feel they should have shown it deflecting off the armor because this is plate and at that range uh, I think there's a good chance the plate would still protect him yeah, definitely at that range. See, but it shows that the arrow is actually stuck through. Survivable, but there is one in his kind of, you know, just under his knee. So, like, it hasn't completely capacitated. That would be, I feel, a bit more debilitating. Still, he then he goes in for cover. And this is where I, I just, I don't think I can find a reason that adequately justifies it with the context of what they show without adding in disingenuous headcanon to explain it. He's basically at their mercy now, okay? He's just been grounded by getting shot in the leg. And so the crab feeder guy, he has him. All you need to do is, like, okay, 20 guys would be able to handle it. Instead, he sends out his whole army. That's, that's what they wanted. They wanted to bait them out, but I don't think this justifies sending out the entire army that he had hunkered up in the caves because if anything this is his most vulnerable point Damon and so now it should be easier to handle than at any time before in this uh, engagement but everyone gets sent out and I'm just not there I think you know there need to be something bigger to justify sending out the whole army perhaps risking the, the dragon have the dragon perhaps be uh, vulnerable and then is like we need to take out the dragon now it's going to take a lot of people but there's a chance to take out a dragon, send everyone out there. This one, it really doesn't do it. I just, it's like, I'd, you'd have to be a pretty big idiot to commit your whole forces to take out a single injured individual now. I know it's very high valuable, high target. 20 guys would be able to do it easy. Whole army, eh. But that is the trap that they wanted because as soon as they come out, it looks like Damon is about to eat, like bite it. Look at all these guys coming in to, to take him out. Oh, look, it's a badass moment where he stands to, you know, against them all. They're ready to just swarm him. And then this is when the dragon comes in and they all get fried. So the tactic, to, like the tactical setup was sound. They needed bait to draw out the army because they're too well protected in these caves. The execution, it was really cool, really enjoyable, but it's just the, the final moment, it's, like, oh, it's not there. That is a legitimate criticism. The thing is, though, so much of this other, uh, the rest of the scene was done really well, particularly what it's saying about Damon as a character and the setup, that is all done so brilliantly, this doesn't ruin it for me, not by a long shot.
And so not only does the dragon come, the rest of the army comes now to uh, take, take everyone out. Uh, the second dragon that the Valyrian house people have come in. See, look, this is the other one. And so this dragon takes out the archers. They, it's a coordinated kind of assault. And the overall battle, it's chaotic. That shot looked a bit fake. Uh, it's chaotic, but pretty well done, honestly, in terms of, you know, battles and everything. If I saw this in a film, a high budget film, I'd think, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, you know, easily good enough. But this is for the, this is a less, it's lower budget than Rings of Power, but it, you know, this fight looks really good and it's a more, a bigger elaborate fight than we've seen in a lot of other Game of Thrones um, uh, episodes. So as a result, and look, a lot of times the dragon looks great. That one looked pretty fake. But here, like, that, that jacket looks brilliant. This is a really good visual effect. So, what we, we saw Damon kind of looking at the um, uh, the crab leader guy. And the battle is gory, bloody. Uh, like, they don't shy away from showing some of the brutality of this. I think it just helps the scene overall. It's pretty brutal in your face. And so Damon sees the, uh, the leader guy retreating into the cave. And he just chases after him. There's Damon running into the cave. I was hoping that they we would get to see the confrontation. This is one of those, it's hard to say which is better. I would have preferred seeing the killing blow, but instead it cuts to Damon walking out of the cave, dragging the guy's upper like body head, like it'd be chopped in half. It's a, look, the way that they do it here does show kind of an impact reveal, like look how badass he is. He just took out this guy, he's covered in blood, chopped him in half. So I see the utility of making the reveal this way and not showing the actual fight. And I, I see benefits to both. So I wouldn't say this is definitively the worser option even though I personally would have liked to have seen him take out the crab guy. There was, there was a couple, you know, they built him up, especially last episode. Would have been good to see his demise. Still very powerful. Like, Damon just walks out with the guys chopped in half. And this is the closing shot of the episode. Damon covered in blood. And that's the end of episode three. Look, seriously, really good. Really good. I could almost be pushed to an 8 out of 10. I'm sitting on the 7.5. House of the Dragons is turning out to be, so far, a very competent, well done, and enjoyable show. I'm more interested than ever to keep watching this. Look, I really hope it doesn't go off the rails. I wouldn't recommend it yet because of what happened with, you know, Game of Thrones and how that ended. But having said that, if you just want some enjoyable episodes and you're not really thinking about what could go you know, if it could go off the rails. These three episodes, they're enjoyable, they're competently done, great characters, it's interesting, engaging. Yeah, so if you're just interested in watching some good episodes, definitely House of Dragons. And by far, it is the, so far, the most competent, well-made show that is currently being released it, by a long shot. The quality difference between this and um, Rings of Power is Stark. Uh, pun not intended, but now I will intend it. So, all right, there we go, guys. Do stay tuned for my Rings of Power episode two review. Hopefully that'll be coming out tomorrow after this episode. Uh, I do hope to see you there. And as always, stay on watch.